So today's uh, topic that we will be reflecting upon together, uh, and I will use English this time as I see that we can understand English much better today. So uh, impermanence. It's something that uh, we are a witness to every day and yet we miss it. <laughs> like the breath goes in, doesn't stay in, goes out. You know, it's not really permanent going in, you know, it moves. Thoughts moving all the time, all the time, coming, going, coming, going, coming, going. And yet we are blinded to the fact of impermanence. So much so that in everyday newspapers we are reading this person dying, that person dying, and yet we are blinded until it happens to us. In our own, you know, our relative or a loved one, when such a person close to us passes away, leaves the body, only then we are like, excuse me, what happened? And all the time it is happening every day. You see night happening, day happening, afternoon, temperature changing. In the morning it's different. Breeze changing throughout the day. So I, I have often wondered about impermanence again and again. And also in Buddhist teachings we see reflections on impermanence very much. And I think that helps. I think that helps. Uh, Buddhist teachings of impermanence have helped me so much because that has helped me kind of wake up every time from my blindness. So much so again that we see that people come and go, relationships are not forever and yet when my friend leaves me, when a relative or a relation with whom I have a very close friendship leaves me, betrays me, it appears like, how can that happen? You know, as if like a shock. So I feel that if things of this life, worldly life, uh, which are shocking <laughs> at times, most of the times, if they still appear as a shock to me, it means true wisdom in me has not yet arisen. Somewhere I still hold on to the things of the life as permanent. No, no, no. The other people may be other, you know, but I am me. With me, how can this happen? With me, things are bound to be permanent. So I think we, we often consider ourselves very special. <laughs> of course, we are special. We, each one is unique and very, 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 you know, we have, as Mother says, each one of us has a mission to fulfill. So in that sense, yes, we are very, very special. Each one of us is very special, unique. But one shared commonness that we have is that our life is as fleeting as anybody else's life. That we don't realize unless it happens to us. So it's very good, I think, when kind of so-called tragedies strike us because only then we empathize with other people what they are going through and now they are not other people anymore they are me you know i share something similar with them so how can we contemplate on impermanence we the other word to use is fleeting ephemeral groundless uncertain shaky shaky, like you can't really uh, pitch your tents here. And if you do, ready to be disappointed, you know. And uh, often time, the illusion that time is, it gives us a feeling of permanence. And that is why so much of crowd around having a home uh, with walls which are unshakable. <laughs> How much we buy into these things, no? The house looks so beautiful and strong as if it will stand forever. But even if we look at history, we see rise and as the song uh, that Richa ji just sang, you know, mat kar maya ko ahankar, mat kar kaya ko abhiman, kaya gar se kachi. So don't be so arrogantly proud of your 
body because it is as uh, fleeting as a clay. What is a clay? Thak. Even if uh, clay is baked in an oven, dropped and gone. So what are we so proud of then? When we see, so that's what I am wondering because I am, I was wondering on this topic and I see that as if I'm blinded by something again and again that I forget the impermanence of life. Because if I truly am connected to the impermanence of life, to the fleetingness of things as they come and go, then how can pride arise? It cannot arise. I think the more connected I am to the groundedness, to the uncertainty of life, it, it keeps me more humble, more grounded because I see, oh, the respect has come and it will go. A good friend has come and bound to go. Whether death may snatch the person away or some situation, circumstance, who knows. So how does the wisdom of impermanence, how does the wisdom of ungroundedness, groundlessness help us in our day-to-day -day life? And how, how do we take it ahead towards the greatest that we can achieve, which is realization of our own true self. So we are very lucky, we are very fortunate that masters have spoken about it. Very strongly in Vipassana. So first they center you on the breath. And when we are centering the first two, three days on the breath, just focusing, concentrating on the breath, rest everything becomes secondary. It is not gone. It has not disappeared yet. My desires are still lying dormant maybe you know, in the corner. But right now, what am I doing? My master told me, focus on the breath. So first three days in Vipassana, usually they stay with the breath. They, f they intensify the concentration. After the third day, second day, they make use of this quality of impermanence in reaching a state of wisdom in the coming seven days. What do they do? Of course, the deeper process we cannot talk about because it's better to experience there, attending yourself a workshop. But what they do is very, very interesting. When I stay in the body and see all the sensations of the body coming, going, coming, going. Even the worst of pains, because in Vipassana you have to sit for a long time. I am sitting, sitting, sitting. My, my leg is as if sleeping, you know, like pins and needles and everything in my leg. Painful, painful, torturous, really torturous on the second and third day. And the moment you tune in with the body, you are amazed to see that if you stay with the torture, it actually comes and goes. It is not there forever. You see the pain changing in character, throbbing, burning, intolerable. You know, all these labels can be given. Huh? Unbearable. Now I have to move my leg. But then you see that if you don't move, if you are able not to kind of shift your leg, after some time, the pain disappears. Isn't that amazing? So. Then we further, these, these are the gross sensations of the body, then we further go deeper within. And we see that the sensations of, because the thoughts won't go anywhere, they are there with me. So thoughts about my storylines, about my life, about the people who did what to me, about the people in my life to whom I did something. All these thoughts will appear. Along with those, what will appear is emotions, jealousy, Greed, ambition, lust, wanting to be something. So all these will appear and along with the feelings and emotions will appear sensations in the body. And the moment you tune in to the sensations in the body, you see, oh my God, if I stay with them, I see that they are also impermanent. They come and go, they come and go. Even the sensation of a kind of an anger, intense anger you are feeling about somebody. And you say that if I tune in to that sensation of anger in the body, I tune in, I stay tuned in with the breath, hanging with the breath, staying with the sensation of the anger, 
it comes and goes it is not permanent so what am i so serious about i am acting through such a sensation which is there right now very very strong imagining itself to be you know the master of my body and after 3 minutes it's gone and i'm acting through that so what happens i think this this contemplation of impermanence and impermanence of fleetingness of sensations and feelings and emotions which we so strongly hold on to our whole life is ruled by these emotions would i still be able to act through an emotion of jealousy or anger or a outburst of something if i truly see how fleeting is it i would not be if the wisdom arises within if the wisdom has not fully arisen what is the wisdom wisdom of seeing them actually practically not in theory not just i heard in in a lecture or something no if you yourself if i myself see how fleeting is an outburst of anger or a jealousy or anything i will not be able to act next time when the outburst happens i will not be able to act this is how we make the life divine i can read volumes of synthesis of yoga and life divine yet i have seen personally in my life nothing changes if i don't work on the body level nothing changes in fact to top on it it becomes an addition on my ego that i have read this book so many times just the opposite direction in which yorubindo wanted us to walk so i feel that this this fact of fleetingness in life is very very crucial i mean even if i wonder about it throughout the day throughout the night and every day of my life i think that should be enough to give me enough wisdom for a lifetime so powerful is the fact of impermanence it gives me empathy because if i re- realize the fleetingness of my own life won't i realize the fleetingness of the other person's life it gives me compassion and not only compassion and empathy it gives me wisdom because then i will not be running behind my short momentary desires and neither will be i running to fulfill the short momentary desires of another person who i claim to love because i know that will not benefit that person in the long run so the more i wake up within the more i can help outside part and parcel so uh, just a few lines from the buddha on this wisdom of impermanence he says i'll just translate in english uh, this is from mahapari nirvan sutta impermanent truly are sankharas by nature constantly arising and vanishing when they arise and are eradicated their cessation brings true happiness so these mental conditionings the way we behave with a certain person the way i behave in a certain situation when it happens to me the conditioning of the mind and emotions he says these are impermanent how beautiful there is hope if they were permanent then there is no hope <laughs> no if i have a, a utensil which is not appropriate for eating right now dirty full of filth there is hope because it can be cleaned isn't that beautiful we can reuse reuse shine it again rub it so he says these sankharas these mental conditionings are impermanent how happy can we be no none of our sins no matter how shameful we are of that sin or an error or an imperfection it is impermanent so we have a hope even for a so called criminal or a terrorist or whatever we are all of those actually out of roaming around out of prison prisons <laughs> but there is hope for us there is hope for each one of us for even that person on whom you are about to give up so impermanent truly are sankharas sankharas are mental emotional conditionings 
by nature constantly arising and vanishing. We see that in us. At times we are so kind, compassionate, wise. At times full of dark clouds. If we see our moods changing throughout the day. It's me who is giving an advice to a friend. What should you do in your life? And it's me who is just feeling so helpless under the impression of a dark outburst of a cloud which has come right now. So it's me, both are me. Coming and going, huh? By nature constantly arising and vanishing, when they arise and are eradicated, when they arise and are eradicated. This is where the catch point is. When they arise, am I conscious of their arisal? For that I have to be in tune with the body, with the breath. If I am not in the body, I don't know what's happening here. So like last time in, in the last talk we were talking about, if somebody says, oh, you have a palace. Did you know that? I, no, I didn't. So I visit that palace. And I realize no one has ever visited this palace in a long time. It's full of dirt. It's full of filth. But it's me. It's mine. That's what they say. So what do I do? I enter the palace. I am tolerant to the dirt and the filth. It's mine. I have to take care of it. My shadows, my darknesses, right? But can be cleaned, are impermanent. So I take a scrubber and begin to clean. Neat and clean again. But that cleaning has to be done every day. It really surprises me that how we give so much attention to the daily cleaning of our houses, really, no? but are blinded to the cleaning within. We pay, especially at least what I see, knowing I live in India, so I, I can say of this place, we give so much attention to the maids are coming or not on time, whether they are cleaning in the corners or not. Oh, you didn't clean over there that day today. But did you clean inside in all the corners today? So as the mind and the emotions and the body are all coming from that inconscient, they have to be taken care of the cleanliness every day, just like we take care of cleaning you know, the sheets and every, everything. The nature is the same. You know, there we have the same nature. So we see that if we leave our discipline or a meditation practice or whatever we are following, for a couple of days, say I leave it, you will see that the dirt begins to accumulate. Amazing. The nature is the same of this solid, inconscient, so-called matter and my mind. Emotions, you know, the inside of me. So same precautions have to be taken care of when I am taking care of the inner palace, which is my mind, feelings, emotions, you know, the psychic. There is a lot of filth on the psychic. That's why it can only shine from within, in between, intermittently. Imagine a glass which has so much of filth on it. Huh? And only if you have a little bit of holes here and there which are very clean, only there the light can pierce through you know, from behind the filth. So our instrument of mind, emotions and body is like that. It has to be taken care of, more so than the physical life that we take care of if not equivalent. I think it was Swami Vivekananda who said that, you know, give a bath to your body and soul every day. And if you can't, don't have enough water at places, you don't have enough water, shortage of water, not enough, uh, you know, luxuries, comforts. At least give your mind and emotions a shower every day. And it is beautiful that we can give that and by the shower, it cleanses because the filth is impermanent. How beautiful, how beautiful. I think it's hope. It really brings so much of hope that the naughtiest of child in your class can be taken care of because there is hope, impermanent. All the conditioning are impermanent. Hmm? So the worst of enemy, the difficult of the person that you think of in your life, even if it be yourself, there is hope. So he says, impermanent truly are the sankharas by nature constantly arising and vanishing. When they arise 
and are eradicated, their cessation brings true happiness. This mantra is enough for me for my lifetime. So much work to be done because I become again and again unconscious of their arising. And I act. And to, to that extent that when I'm acting through my anger, I actually feel it's an holy anger, holy anger, sacred anger. We actually, you know, use that garb. See, I'm doing some special holy sacred work. So my anger is justified. No anger is justified. We have to know, of course, the mother uses her Mahakali weapon every time she wants to use from us, through us, wherever. But I think we, we have to be very careful. <laughs> it's a very tight rope to walk on, very tight rope. Not to claim that mother is acting her Mahakali avatar through me. <laughs> when you are acting angry on other person. Don't do that, no? Very, very careful. We better be the Mahalakshmi avatar of mother, <laughs> no? full of abundance, prosperity, and sweetness. No? And then again, uh, another one verse that I want to say, share here. Impermanent are all compounded things. When one perceives this with insight, then one turns away from suffering. This is the path of purification. So when I don't act through my anger, through the, all the negativities which Sri Aurobindo describes in Synthesis of Yoga, that they have to be, like there is a fire, Agni, you know, in front of you, and they are to be put like sacrifices. The whole bouquet, he says, of anger, jealousy, greed, ambition, all, all of them come together. Then you, you name one thing and the others will follow, he says. So I can't say that I only have anger but no jealousy. It's not possible. possible. It's not possible. I only have anger but no ego. Kidding me. Hmm? It's only a little bit of greed that I have left in me, you know. But ego, I, do, I can't see. <laughs> what stupidity that we can buy ourselves into. So with ego comes all this, the whole bouquet of all the negativities. But again, we come back to the hope. The hope is they are all eradicate cable. You know, they, you, we have to put them as sacrifices in the fire of our true consciousness. So the more we put all these things as sacrifices in the fire, the fire grows. Sri Aurobindo says the fire grows. And as the fire grows, your true consciousness grows. And true consciousness is full of wisdom, clarity, compassion, equanimity. Why equanimity? Because now I don't run to the promises of the world that world offers me because I know it cannot give me anything lasting. And how do I know that? It, the wisdom has arisen in my body. It cannot be gotten through. The wisdom cannot come through only, only reading, reading, reading. It has to be in the body. The change has to be in the body. That's what we were talking of. That the moment that sankhara arises, the moment the conditioning arises, how I act within another person or a job or ma marketplace or wherever I am, how I think, there are triggers shot at me from outside, but how I think on that trigger, that is also conditioning. Why do I have to think in that way all the time? Mother says, ask yourself. Ask yourself, why do I think like that every time the, a person made, makes that comment to me? Why? As if like a groove is running and I always act robotically to that groove. No? There is no free will that I exercise. We have to choose. We have the capacity to choose. And Sri Aurobindo says, to that extent in Savitri, he says, man can refuse his fate. So a trigger comes. How do I refuse my fate? You know, one small example, day-to-day -day example that I can use. A trigger comes. 
daily trigger a person known to you maybe unknown to you throws at you something which he throws he or she you see your old pattern arising negative full of dark cloud you recognize it you're conscious you're in the body and you keep breathing you don't act that way you step back from that automatic reaction and the moment i am able to step back one time we don't realize the impact of it mother says if we are able to step back from our desires no one will notice your name will not come in the newspaper of course but do you know the amount of ripple is it has created in the collective consciousness that's one drop of nectar that you have thrown in the collective consciousness one drop of poison less one drop of nectar more so unknowingly you don't even know what you have done again same with anger and other things no you didn't act you stepped back not only did you cut through all your ancestral heritage of acting through the same emotion again and again that way not only did you do that you actually created a beautiful fragrance somewhere in the collected consciousness collective consciousness which you don't even realize how much you have contributed so i feel that how much we can do staying at home dealing with all the daily things that that we do maybe not doing some outwardly meaningful work that we may think but just changing our reactions to small small triggers not thinking in a negative way as we will to the daily persons that we meet every day how beautiful what a change you are actually socially contributing but we don't realize so no need of going outside and socially contributing of course we do that <laughs> not saying that we don't do that but within our own little narrow spheres so called narrow they are not narrow so called narrow because they look narrow the walls of the house in which i live are not true actual walls quantum physics will tell us it's all interconnected so whatever little contribution that we make in our own inward journey it goes out and mother says it creates a ripple we have contributed small mission served and not only to our own self but we don't know to and maybe that ripple will touch someone who is also struggling to step back from anger and who knows today he gets the strength to step back you don't even know that you contributed you won't get a bharat bhushan or whatever you know the the awards you get by prime minister or a president but the divine has seen your work and you will be more peaceful the people around will be more peaceful you will be more courageous that now i can live shamelessly a life that is worth living not pleasing anyone but doing what i ought to do you know inwardly changing my character and this we see changing of a character is so difficult then the moment we start to work on ourselves our impulses our reactions then we realize oh my god it's so as if something is torturing you it's actually that sri aurobindo mention, mentions in savitri it's a, as if somebody is like you know screwing some nails in you and chiseling and shaping you it it hurts but what gets hurt is only the ego your true self he says grows with every pang so i feel again uh, coming back to what we started with that there is hope that all our defilements in buddhism they say all our defilements and afflictions are temporary they are like dark clouds of monsoon yes appearing very dark creating almost no light during the day time but behind that is a luminous sky they are only there temporary how can we use this in day to day our you know in life there are times which are very tough then we can go to an astrologer and ask what planet is behaving in what way people do ask and it may be true planets do have a role but that doesn't help me 
the only thing that helps me is when the astrologer tells this too shall pass <laughs> only a few months sustain persist i have been helped you know frankly speaking there was a very bad time that i went through very extremely you know mind boggling time and the astrologer said this too shall shall pass i was happy <laughs> so when bad times are coming this really really is so helpful that thank god that the bad times are not permanent no matter how hard we try to hold on to things as permanent but thank god that bad times are not permanent and so is with the good times because good times also if they are too permanent lack of adventure no our souls jumped into this adventure because of the like of adventure we like adventure and what is an adventure if all the only good 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 things are happening you know so we like unknown territories so we are here for an adventure we are not here for a very limited narrow life we have to remind ourselves we are not here to buy a house and be always settled in that house it's a wrong perception that the social environment give us buy a better house and a better building which will last for longer why because you are as if you are here to settle we are not here to settle so how the fact of impermanence helps me is that i'm happy to be unsettled more adventure very happy when things become uncertain and wavy and shaky something is boiling you know in the cooking pot more adventure so the spirits who have all of us are you know uh, who have jumped into this adventure should remind themselves that oh my god why am i now shaking away from adventure i came for this adventure so when something unsettles something happens like a betrayal or something wow let's see you know what's in store like that so impermanence is beautiful impermanence gives hope impermanence gives adventure impermanence also disappoints of course pa part of life impermanence gives empathy wisdom it gives me a connect and a fullness in the present moment because how do i know whether i am alive in the next days or not you know of course we know uh, some person i met she was sharing that this doesn't appeal to me the fact that i will not be here you know maybe life is uncertain and who knows that i am dead after a day or not of course she has a point why she has a point because we somewhere have a lingering memory of our true self which is actually immortal so i don't feel that i am going to die just like in a day or two why because i feel again this is a personal reflection i feel that this is coming from a lingering memory as shorobindo mentions in savitri of our true consciousness which never dies which continues after birth death birth death continues continues so then i it doesn't appear to me other people may be dying but i cannot die you know so impermanence gives me fullness in the present moment in the sense that how do i know whether i am there in the next moment or not so i better behave the best i can behave in this very moment also if i have acted in a bad way to a person or a situation and now in retrospect i look at it just a while it happened and now i can look back at it it would not be a big deal to say a sorry because i want to you know make the accounts harmonious because who knows i don't want to carry further credits and debits you know ahead so i feel that along with all the disappointments that uh, impermanence may bring owing to what it snatches away from us i feel that it also brings lots of fullness in life richness in life and uh, a kind of a sense of adventure you know ready for something new since the things are not as they are or have been all these years 
So we can take a few comments and after that I can maybe share a few lines from Savitri. No, thank you, thank you for the lovely talk and uh, impermanence is such a nice topic, very relevant mm. and all of us need to understand. What I like best is the importance of daily cleaning, mm. right? Mm. Uh, two days we don't take a bath, how do we feel? Mm. But do we really think like that, that we don't sit and meditate mm. or, you know, mm. don't clean the vasanas mm. which are attached to our mind? Mm. That struck a great deal with me, yeah. right? Many times, one week also we miss. But do we miss taking bath for a one week? Mm. And mm. Uh, can we compare the two? Are mm. we thinking like that? Mm. It mm. really strikes, uh, mm. struck a big chord within mm. me. And uh, mm. I think that will make me sh mm. make sure that I do the sadhanas every day. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wants to add on or share anything? Okay. Did you want to add on? Uh, can you pass on the mic? Either here. <coughs> Thank you. I was reminded of uh, something that Swami Vivekananda often used to say that uh, when nothing works and you are at a loss, just remember and remind yourself every day that you are going to die mm. and repeat it to yourself n number of times and you will see the changes that take place Absolutely. in the way you work, in the way you think. And another thing that also struck me was uh, mother has given a very, uh, you can say, strong uh, connotation or uh, importance to service, the way mother has uh, given it is very poignant and it's very so relevant. In fact, uh, once uh, somebody was very ill and not able to work and other disciples were telling the mother and the mother said, uh, and work is service for, um, so the mother said that, uh, is he coming for work? <laughs> so mm. it also brings out that when we start working and when we get into the spirit of service, all the more imperman impermanence it is going to strike, but also the answers are going to come mm. through work. Mm. Very true, very true. Thank you. Didi, I want to just uh, add a few words. Uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, discussion on impermanence. Um, there are a few things that uh, struck me. Swami Vivekananda, he uses uh, four kinds of yoga. Uh, one is uh, Karma Yoga, uh, second one is Raja Yoga, third one is Bhakti Yoga, and fourth one is Jnana Yoga. Karma Yoga cleanses our mind. Uh, like what you said, you offer everything to the fire of consciousness. That is Karma Yoga, where anything we do, whether it's uh, you know, service or anything, we do it as a service to the higher nature, not for yourself, service to the higher nature. That cleanses our mind. That's what you exactly said, that cleanses our mind. But our mind is so fickle, right? Arjuna says in Gita chapter 6 that the mind is like a air. I can't hold it. It's like a thin air. I don't know how to control. Uh, that's where bhakti comes in. That's where you do meditation, right? That helps us to bring that ekagrata. They call that ekagrata. Bring the mind together. Uh, and then you have, that's Raja Yoga for from Vivekananda, which is basically bhakti and meditation. Bhakti Yoga and Raja Yoga basically bring your mind together. The, the knowledge you just mentioned, the wisdom, has to stay with us, right? It is also an impermanence, right? The wisdom, if we do not practice, do not remind our wisdom, it will go off. A few days you might have, few years you might have the wisdom, but after a few years, if you don't practice, if you're not reminding yourself, I have seen people who are in a good mm. path, mm. after a few years, they are out, yeah. right? You need to keep on practicing. 
and for that you need to have that you know mind control you need to have that's where the meditation helps the raj yoga and bhakti yoga come and then of course the wisdom is the jnana yoga I, it reminded me of these four things mm. you, you mm. talked about that absolutely thank you thank, thank you. you very much yeah. thank you i think you are very correct when you say that it can make a u turn exactly because for a long time changes are happening but our nature has not changed right so what do you mean by uh, what i perceive by my nature has not changed by default i think negatively by default i will make a judgment about the person i meet this is my older nature lower nature we can say and it takes a very long that's what they say you know long 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 time so be very careful that it it is not fully you know taken a turn because to that point that when i meet a person and interact with a person being judgmental is not in my purview at all it 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 is not my nature now it takes a long 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 time so for a long time what i will have to do is i will have to see the judgments arising that's what we were talking you know see them arise put them aside see them arise put them aside they are not worth anything so for a long time we continue doing that and slowly slowly so that that's why mother says the transformation of nature is a very very tedious task because how now i will not act negatively or you know think negatively is a long time process yeah so yes we have to be very careful sure. steadfast yeah. yeah thank you thanks yes please yeah. can you hear me yeah so <coughs> i have confusion and um this concept of impermanence is beautiful but a lot of my work is with people including myself who go through existential crisis hmm if we are working towards this and this anyway doesn't mean anything then what are we working towards hmm. and somewhere impermanence is an answer somewhere uh, the concept of impermanence in itself creates a cloud you know so what are we working towards and in my head i was negotiating this while you were speaking and mm. i was also trying to see how does one explain this concept then of impermanence as hope to a young mind mm. Mm. i really seek your knowledge and mm. wisdom on this mm. no i think it's very uh, first of all it's context to context but secondly there also is a generalization that's why we are generally discussing the topic and why uh, the confusion can be cleared away is that we are not saying that there is no purpose to all this i mean that's why i am talking of rubbing the utensil because there is a purpose we want the clean utensil everybody loves the clean utensil loves it how beautiful it feels when you go to a restaurant or a cafe and the plates and the cutlery that they give you are neat clean you know fresh out of whatever right it feels nice it feels good and like that people human beings who are going through psychological crisis we all go through that right we are also seeking for that clarity we may not admit the person who is coming to you may not admit that he is seeking that clarity he doesn't even know what he is seeking but he is seeking that clarity within himself that you as a therapist know when a child comes to me and demands for a lollipop and is after that lollipop you give it to me otherwise you are not my mother or whatever right i know that the child is not seeking the lollipop he is seeking the satisfaction he gets when the lollipop is in his mouth and that satisfaction is impermanent so what we are going to do as therapists we as therapists are not going to talk to them of impermanence that would not work in many cases we are going to lead them in our own ways to clean 
keep off cleaning the dirt. Why? Because cleanliness feels nice. And that is what will bring us lasting happiness within, not sucking on a lollipop. So I feel that we have to be very uh, you know, sharp in mind to see because every context is different, every child is different, every person coming to you is different. You don't know which will work with what, who, you know, who will benefit with what. I know of a very interesting case in heritage school where, uh, you know, contemporary world, all kinds of influences are there, people have money, and money often is used for bad purposes rather than good. So the child uh, in class eight or nine will bring some kind of a liquor in his bottle in the school. And the child was lots of, full of energy, very intelligent child otherwise, but very naughty in the sense of, of a gunda type, you know, you can say. So this fellow who was from a Krishnamurti school in Chennai, he had come to heritage school and he took charge of that fellow who brought liquor in his bottle. And I was amazed to see, I don't know how he dealt with the child. He must have done something good. The child was a changed child after one year of constant interaction with that fellow. And all his energies were put to good use. So I think that's where impermanent helps us as a therapist. That, oh, these sins that are on the cover are not really you know, belonging to his true consciousness. So as a therapist, that helps me and gives me hope. But how I use it would be a very different thing. You know? Yeah, that's what I feel. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. So shall we read just two, three lines from Savitri and then? So I love this uh, canto, particular one, book six, uh, canto two. The way of fate and the problem of pain, where uh, Ashwapati and the queen, Savitri's mother and father, especially the mother is very, very troubled by what is going to happen to uh, Savitri. And she asks, why is this world created? So much of pain and suffering and you know, the people are left to their own like that. And then Narat says that no, you know, that's not whole of the story, there is more to it. So he says, I'll just jump from here and there, if you read a few lines. O mortal, who complainest of death and fate, accuse none of the harms thyself hast called. This troubled world thou hast chosen for thy home, thou art thyself the author of thy pain. Then I'm jumping. A mind arose that stared at nothingness till figures formed of what could never be. If we look at our mind, we make real things which are actually not real. And we make them so concrete by thinking of them again and again that this is how it is. Hmm? So a mind arose that stared at nothingness till figures formed of what could never be. Hmm? Then he goes further, the soul, uh, talking of adventure in which we leaped, the soul attracted, leaned to the abyss. It longed for the adventure of ignorance and the marvel and surprise of the unknown. So for all of us, our life ahead is unknown. We don't know. This is what we have longed for. Hmm? Something new, a fresh, unknown. Surprise. And later he also says that the chance meetings we have with strangers are also planned. No? <laughs> it, the soul, it tired of its unchanging happiness, turned away from immortality. It was drawn to the hazard's call and danger's charm. It yearned to the pathos of grief and the drama of pain. won't go ahead because it's the whole canto is so beautiful you can read. So one thing which we realize is that looking at things which are fleeting, 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 that which is looking ever stays. 
this is the permanence we are all seeking. The consciousness which is conscious of the impermanence, has it ever, has, have you ever seen it go away? And that is what we talk about, that we can never grip it. The moment we want to grip that consciousness, we see that nothing tangible comes to us. And that is why they say, you can be it. And that's how you know it. So just leaving us with that reflection, that the consciousness which looks at the things changing is not changing. Thank you so much. Thank you.